The sky tonight is blacker than I've ever seen it before. It swirls with slow malevolence, growling and warning. My scarf is pulled up to my eyes, but my cheeks and nose are still burning pink with the bitter cold regardless. I'm in line with others, waiting to board the ship that'll take me from the rig. The winds tonight are too powerful for helicopter travel, so ship it is. It's a military vessel, Royal Navy. The grey white waves crash against its hull. Spray carries on up to the Union Jack ensign stamped on the side. I'm not sure if the ship's military nature makes me feel more or less afraid, but I don't have a choice. Seven workers are always selected to board. Always. And tonight, I am one of those seven. My name is Reg. I spend alternating months working on an oil rig in the North Sea. The work is not as boring as you might expect, and the pay grade is actually rather good. The boredom is the worst part. The isolation. Interspersed with the moments of intense stress and lightning-like panic. We get Wi-Fi on the good days, but it's spotty at best. If you like your YouTube at lowest quality with 20 minutes of buffering time, then the rig is the place for you. There's about 200 of us here at any given time, and honestly, sometimes it's kind of nice. During the day, in rare hours of warmth, the sun sparkles off the pipes and the railings in white and bright yellow. The mood is cheerful, everyone has their purpose, everyone has their role. Then, the other times, the other times, you'll find yourself stood on the bridge in the grim hours before dawn, frozen in place as you desperately tried to fix the shitty job the engineer before you did on the generator that powers the crane, made all the more difficult with the torn and battered gloves that limit the motions of your already shaken fingers. The protective goggles quickly steam to the point of uselessness, so you take them off only for the icy rain to lash at once in your eyes. What can I say? There's good days and bad days, can't complain. My shifts on the rig are typical, as I mentioned, one month on, one month off. We get helicopters back as a squad of about 20 or 25. We go our separate ways once back on the mainland, and then I'll see some of them again next month when we return to work. Occasionally some of them will get moved to other rigs pretty straightforward, but there's an anomaly, one that I've always wondered about. I've asked around, but no one is able, or perhaps willing, to give me a straight answer. Five days before the end of my shift on the rig, seven of my colleagues are selected, randomly or otherwise, I don't know. They are chosen late in the afternoon, told to gather their belongings, and then by night, they are gone. Move to other rig is all I am ever told on the matter, when I actually find someone to give an answer at all. This happens without fail, five days before the end of my shift, every shift, and has done since I first began the work earlier in the year. The people that are selected, I never see again. Most times, if I even know them by name at all, they are only acquaintances, but sometimes I've known them personally. I had the details of a man who was chosen four months ago, and a good friend of mine, a guy named Figs, was called for the previous assignment, but they both stopped answering their calls. Most of us use crappy phones offered by the company during our shifts on the rig, so it's possible the devices were just ditched in favor of better models upon their return to the land, but still, I can't shake the unease, and I'm not sure why I seem to be the only one concerned. Not that it matters now anyway. Today marks five days before the end of my shift, and for the first time, I find myself as one of the workers selected. Normally, when I'm able to catch their departure for myself, they weave by helicopter, but tonight the sky is too fierce, so the aforementioned military ship has pulled itself alongside the rig. Why exactly our departure has to be on this particular night? Why our journey is important enough to warrant a Royal Navy battleship to personally escort us to the new location, I don't know. I ask some of the other six, my fellow chosen colleagues, but they know just as little. One by one we are ushered down the line, out of the biting rain from the edge of the platform and into the body of the ship as the storm hammers down overhead. 
were led through cold and narrow metal corridors and into a meeting room of sorts where we awkwardly take the offered seats. The ship groans and churns, the engine rumbles steadily from down below, and two men make their way between us to the front of the room. One walks slouched, his beard and hair are scruffy, mid-fifties perhaps. I recognize him. He makes appearances on the rake from time to time, but he's not a regular lodger, nor do I know his name. He places forms on the desks before us as he meanders from person to person. The other man's face is measured and deliberate, straight-backed. He turns at the head of the room and takes us all in cool silence. He wears an immaculate white shirt beneath a blue-gray jersey and a naval cap, also in white. It is ringed at the base and visor in sleek black and shining gold, and his shoulders are bedecked with epaulets in the same colors. Once the scruffier man has handed out the last form, he stands in the opposite corner, chewing his tongue as he looks us over. The man in white steps forward. Gentlemen, my name is Captain John Irons, and I am in command of this destroyer. Destroyer? What the hell? Why would a tiny beam of oil riggers need to be transported on a bloody destroyer? I'll get right to it. The forms before you now, if signed, will bind you to the Official Secrets Act. Your involvement in this operation will be entirely secret. You will be forbidden to discuss the operational logistics, machinery, or any self-assumed purpose of the assigned rig, even to the members of your own immediate family. For all intents and purposes, any military involvement in your assignment will be purely extraneous, operating on an ad hoc basis in the event of threat to life weather events. The captain clenches his jaw and scans the room from left to right. You have all been selected for this temporary position based on a combination of factors including your specialist knowledge, your time served, and the results of your personality and psychological assessments. You are welcome to refuse this assignment. If you choose to do so, you will be escorted off the ship and back into the rig where you will see out your allocated time. If you accept the offer, and you must come to the decision in the next few minutes, it is recommended that you spend the journey time reading through your contracts. If upon docking at the signed rig, you decide that you no longer wish to sign the document before you, then you will be given a room and confined to your quarters for the duration of your service, and may remain confined for a period of up to an additional two weeks depending on the schedule of the ship in question. Is that understood? His question is followed by a strained silence, one which eventually breaks into a series of low mumblings and bewildered nods from the people around me. You should choose to accept. Your pay rate for the following five days will be increased tenfold, and will in practice be worth the equivalent of two and a half months of solid service. My colleagues exchange a series of glances and raised eyebrows. The energy in the room changes somewhat. You will be expected to perform your role to the best of your abilities, of course. The captain continues. And, as discretion is of the utmost importance, to ask as few questions as will allow you to see out your duties. His sharp gray eyes stopped on mine, just for a moment, before flicking over to meet those of the fellow in the corner, the scruffy man who occasionally visits the rig. My rig. A chill passes through me, but I say nothing. I will now ask if anyone would like to refuse the offered assignment and return to the rig. Now is your one and only chance to do so. Nobody moves. Nobody speaks. I thought about it. I really did. I swear. This whole thing has me set very much on edge. And this assignment, this offered assignment, this man, this military guy, who the hell is he to issue us job terms and warnings and ultimatums? A part of me wants to scrunch the document into a ball and throw it into his face and march proudly back onto my rig where I belong, but this, this opportunity to venture out into the unknown, this is some real exciting shit. I don't even care about the money that much, to be honest. I have been given a chance to see behind the curtain, 
to find out what's so important about our destination. Mysteries have been presented to us. Mysteries that demand solving. I have to know. I just have to know. So I stay seated and listen to the dulled roar of the wind through the walls. Perhaps that's how they convince the Seven to stay every time. Maybe the money is just so we can rationalize our decisions. A tense moment passes, then the captain looks over our shoulders and nods to someone at the back of the room. I turn in my seat to see an officer raise a radio to his mouth as he steps through the door, speaking into it as he walks away down the corridor and a minute later the rumble of the engine below grows like rowing thunder and the ship, I can only presume, as there are no windows in the room, groans into slow life. The captain nods to us, then to the man at the corner, and takes his leave, strong in a way at once. And so we begin our voyage to the assigned rig, blowing onwards through the storm. I read through the secrets act before me as we make our journey over the waves. There's some seriously cool concepts in here. Makes me feel a bit like a spy, though there's some terrifying stuff too. The time drags on. I wonder exactly where it is we're going. Left with nothing but the sound of the engine, the flicker of turning paper and the occasional grunt or cough from my colleagues, my mind begins to wander. They swirl with curious, dark clouded thoughts. Dread creeps up on me. It ebbs and flows coming and receding like the tide, and I start to wonder if I've made a huge mistake. We were forced to decide so quickly. My stomach turns. I look up and I meet the eyes of the man still stood in the corner. I clear my throat and sit up in my seat. Excuse me mate, don't I recognize you? I see you on the rig sometimes. The man is silent for a moment, then scratches his beard. All right. Work takes me from rig to rig. You ought to have a good location, less stormy than most. And what about the one we're going to? Will it be stormy there? I ask. The man sighs, not in frustration, perhaps just with tiredness. Yeah, yeah, it'll be stormy. The others seem a little emboldened now. The seal is broken and the questions start coming. Which rig is it? Will any of us have been stationed there before? No. The man replies. No, you won't have been. This one ain't charted. Officially, it don't even exist. Is the military owned then? Like a secret navy supply of oil? Or is that why it's been taken by the battleship? The scruffy man's eyes stare to the door at the back of the room and he rubs his nose. It ain't a oil rig as such. The machinery and the systems will be similar to what you're used to, however, as the captain said, for all intents and purposes, any military involvement in this assignment is officially ad hoc. In the event of emergency, less said the better, etc. But if it isn't oil, I ask, my blood, for reasons unknown, pumping fears. Then what is it? What's its purpose, and why is it secret? Silence falls, and the man, in a low voice, replies. Honestly, lads, you don't need to concern yourself with the rake's true purpose. Nor do I recommend you try to understand. Please, I don't even know myself, I swear it, and it's better this way. I appreciate that this is a frustrating answer, but I must emphasize that it is in all our best interests for you to just do your work, take your money, and get the fuck home. Do you understand me? I nod quietly, and the crew alongside mumble their acknowledgements. The gears in my mind begin to turn and grind bitterly as the curious ship sails on into the night. It is well into the earliest hours of the dark morning by the time we arrive, the sky is still black and angry as we depart the destroyer. I slip and stumble against the rail as the ship rocks over the surface of the swirling sea. We all signed the Secrets Act, of course. How could we not? The captain lights the ship alongside us, and as we huddle awkwardly on the rain-soaked platform of the rig, he goes to exchange some words unheard with a man in a uniform I do not recognize. 
obscured mostly anyway by an enormous blue jacket. I squint my eyes through the downpour and take in my surroundings. The rig is colossal, bigger than the one we departed and hectic. Even at this time of the night, the place is alive with people in heavy overalls and military uniforms. Soldiers can be seen patrolling at every level of the giant metal derrick. A group passes right by us. Most have the British flag emblazoned on their arms, but a couple towards the back have Norwegian insignia instead. Lamps and searchlights illuminate the rain in thick, heavy streaks as they scan the bridges and platforms distorted shadow thrown across their surfaces by the rails and pipework. But inside the derrick, protected by the great iron skeleton, there is no pipeline for any oil. There is no hose that I can see, no drill line at all. I raise a hand to my eyes to shield them from the rain. I take a step away from the group and stare, even as a powerful beam of light washes over my face. Inside the crisscross metal tower is an enormous monstrous chain, the largest that I have ever seen. Each link must be in the size of a car, at least. It is colossal and terrifying in a way I do not quite understand, and standing here on the platform only a few meters away, I find myself feeling very small, very small indeed. The chain disappears behind the beams of the tower that supports it and below the surface of the platform. It extends, presumably deep down under the sea. For what purpose, I do not know. I am suddenly slammed into from behind. I stumble in shock and turn to see who pushed me and a roaming light shows me a man with a hard hat in his outstretched hand, his eyes bloodshot red and shadowed with dark circles. He is a mess, and when he looks at me, it feels like he's staring right through me. Are you out the takeover crew then? He croaks out in a voice hoarse beyond exhaustion. I exchange looks with the men around me. Yeah? I reply uneasily. Yeah, I think we might be. A siren suddenly sounds at the far side of the derrick, a loud and obnoxious wail, and we jump and start in alarm. Well as new arrivals do. The embattled man before me does not even flinch. He just closes his eyes, starts shaking his head. No, he mutters, then louder. No, 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 fuck, no more. He slams the hard hat into my stomach and marches past. The soldiers have begun bellowing orders, but I cannot hear them above the wind and the blare of the siren. Fear ripples through me as the platform beneath me starts to shake. Captain Irons from the ship is suddenly in front of us, barking orders. He's hastily reading off a list of names, telling my colleagues where to go, and in a chaotic scramble, they do as they're told. This does not seem the time or place for questioning of roles. The ground shakes. I hear the waves crash against the legs of the rig, and for that to be even possible, for me to hear them above the bellows in the roaring gale and the shriek of the siren, they must be colossal indeed. I can see some of the sea out of the corner of my eye, and it's a picture of wild, dark and churning fury, but my gaze is focused on something else. Blood pounds in my ears to join the cacophony. I am vaguely aware of the captain shouting my name, but I fail to copy his orders. He stepped forward now, shaking my shoulder vigorously, but I cannot move. I am frozen in place in blind terror, and I do not even know why. There's something about this whole rig that isn't right. It isn't right at all. And I cannot tear my eyes from the great chain. The terrible chain, obscene in its size, is no longer still. It grinds and shakes with the storm, and I watch in disbelief as it starts to unravel, as if something, some unknown force, is dragging it desperately deep below the surface. 